Teacher, what star is that? It, 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 it's my own secret technique. Bishop, 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 Bishop,
<laughs> yeah, that's that's a that's oh a hard God. thing for me to remember those and were, pronounce. Those were hilarious. No, we I mean we 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 were a trip too. No, no reason, no reason. So look, man, um I've told my story about starting in hip hop journalism. For me, it was 1987. I was I was at high school and and I got to interview Easy E early. You know what I'm saying? But it wasn't until I saw your stuff being published that I really believed it could be a path. I knew I wanted to do it, right? But that it could be done. Um, I remember where I was in Tamfran Mall in San Bruno. There was a warehouse upstairs across from the movie theater for the people that remember Tamfran Mall. You know what I'm saying? Right. And I picked up a BAM magazine and you were in there. Oh, okay. And and you that back was to the BAM days. Dude, that was my understanding that hip hop journalism could be real. I knew that I wanted to do it. Right. But I saw you and you kind of gave an overview of the Bay and you had a column in there. I was like, what? I became addicted to, you know, following Bam, understanding who you were and and paying close attention to the way that you wrote and the care that you gave writing. But what I wanted to know is what was your first published piece on hip hop and how did that happen? I'm very curious. So. There's three ways to look at it. There's what I wrote, mm -hmm. there's what I self-published, and then there's my publishing being picked up. So right. Bam, Bam is the third uh, entree into that. Um, actually, the fourth. Okay. So the the first thing that I published was self-published, and that was the Bay Area Beat Report, Okay. Or the Davy D beat report, which was probably 86, 87, Damn. Um, when I started doing a, a radio show. And instead of just putting out a flyer, I put out a playlist. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because people would read a playlist before they right. read a flyer. Before they actually, yeah, yeah, work. And then underneath the, the playlist, I wrote about the songs that I was playing on, on the station. Right. That's the first published piece. Um, and coincidentally, it kind of coincides within a month of the same time that uh, Dave Mays, who I talked to recently, and John Schechter, well, actually John Schechter, and then we're doing uh, the, source. the Source in Boston. We yeah. had no idea about each other. Yeah. But, but nevertheless, that's, that's what happened. Okay. The second piece came with MC Hammer. Okay. So, you know, there was a strategy behind doing the Bay Area Beat Reports, which included um, using the station's mail address, asking for people's addresses, mm -hmm. and then sending it directly to them. Smart. So, you know, I want to say by 88, I might have had 700 people on a list. Yeah. And was just having the station mail it out. and That was know. so crazy, bro. Like, the impact of that was so massive because – I think that you, I mean, did you understand that the hunger was there or were you trying to find out if the hunger was, was there? I was like, trying to get records. Right. And, and, and I, and, and I just started writing to I look on the back of record labels and just send them. Right. Um, so through that, I met um, public enemy. That's how I met Chuck D. Wow. Chuck called me from that. That's how I got my job at BAM. Bam wow. saw the column and, and asked me to do it for, you know, asked me to do a column for them. Now, was that a paying gig? Yeah, the paying gig. Wow, so, that's so unbelievable, that. bro. At that I, time, that was unthinkable, straight up. Yeah, yeah, no, I got paid. Um, and pretty good, actually. Um, yeah, yeah. Then I got picked up by KPFA. Right. Um, Shout out then, to KPFA. Yeah. Then a group of us linked together. I want to say it was probably 88. Mm. It was Marcus Clemens mm. from K oh, K -K Baby. KPO. Yeah. KK Baby for sure. Kevy Kev. Yeah. Um, the OG. Who else was there? I'm not sure if Benny was there yet, but it was at my house and we formed the Bay Area Hip Hop Coalition. That's right. And then what we did was I took the Davy D beat report and converted it to the Bay Area beat report. Wow. And the area beat report, we, you know, we're still sending it out with the same type of uh, strategy, but mm -hmm. now it featured the charts from everybody and expanded to maybe two, two, probably about yeah, two pages front and back. Right. I remember. And uh, that's how I got picked up by KML. Wow. Um, that's how so you got. That's funny because that was one of my questions is how did you get to KML? KML. But, so, but 
before you say that, here's what I wanted to ask, because I know you're originally from New York, mm-hmm. right? Um, now you're from Bronx River, correct? Where are you no, from? Soundview. Exactly? Soundview. You're from Soundview. Okay. Thank Big you. Big difference. Yeah. yeah, I know. I know. I'm, 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 I'm trying to make sure I, I'm trying to learn. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, no. So, no, I appreciate. So, so what brought you to the Bay? How did you end up here? And what did you first learn about the Bay Area hip hop scene in the West Coast? Like coming from such a like nucleus yeah. of, of, of traditional hip hop. So my background in New York is that I'm from the Soundview section. And Soundview, where I live specifically, is next to what we call the Big Park, mm. which is Kitty Corner to Bronxdale. Okay. Bronxdale is the home to actually people who preceded a lot of the pioneers. Um, it's the home to Justice Sotomayor, so it's called Sotomayor Projects now. Damn. Um, but that was the home of Disco King Mario. Okay, yeah, I've always known that name. I've always known that name. So the first name I heard in hip hop was not Herc, but I heard the name Disco King Mario. Um, that's the first name I heard. He was doing block parties. I was too young to go to those block parties. You're talking about 74, 75. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, Andre Harrell lived there. A um, bunch of people lived in. in, in All right, Peter Andre and, Harrell. Yeah, a yeah, bunch of people lived over there. Um, it was also the first division of the Black Spades. Paradise lived there. So, oh, that's my dog, too. Yeah, Shout out, so, Paradise. So Paradise lived, uh, I think, upstairs okay. from Disco King Mario. Soundview, where I na- later lived, um, so I moved to Riverdale for a while, and then we moved over to Soundview, back to Soundview, uh, across the street from the, from the Soundview houses. Mm was right up the road from Bronxdale, and that was an epicenter. That whole area was an epicenter for, for hip hop. I was an MC at the time, and so I was in a, tr- I was in a crew called uh, TDK, Total Deaf Crew. And what, what of, year would this have been? This would have been what? This would have been 79. Okay. So I was in TDK, and I was out of Co-op City Section 2. So anybody who knows Co-op City, Section 2 and Section 5 was where all the black people lived. So Okay. In there with a with a guy who started his name was Terror Ride Karen McQuinday. Mm-hmm. He was from a place called Rhodesia at the time, but Zimbabwe. So Dang, really, my man said Rhodesia. You gotta mm-hmm. be from our generation to know Rhodesia. Rhodesia that's yeah. a that's a map thing. You know what yeah. I'm talking about? Where where colonialism and neocolonialism play out. Continue, brother. Continue. So he was he was the dope MC, and it was me, him, DJ G, and Mystery. And so in Co-op City, that is near another epicenter for hip hop, which is the Valley and uh, right across the freeway would have been Edenwall housing project. So out of there, you have DXT um, in the Valley in that area. That's where Baron and Breakout come from. Uh, that's where Shah Rock and all of mm-hmm. those people started. Mm-hmm. So that's mm-hmm. a whole other section of the Bronx off the number two and five line. I want to say right. I might, might have the train line wrong. So that was one crew, and the other crew was um, the Double D crew, or no, the Avengers. And okay. the Avengers was over at the Marble Hill section of the Bronx, which is right around the Riverdale section. Word. So I was in those two crews. I was a, I was an MC, pretty good MC. Yeah, yeah. Um, I wouldn't you, expect nothing less. You know what I'm saying? Now, did you go by Davey D then? What was your name I, then? I started out as MC DC and then went to Davey D. Um, okay. And... In high school, I was in high school with Barry Bistro from the Crash Crew. Okay, okay. Um, kid from Kid and Play was in the same school. Kevy Kev, Cool Breeze Kevy Kev. We were all in high school together. And there are a few other people that came yeah. out of that high school. Um, so we were all in there. I was actually, believe it or not, you know, Kid will tell you, I was rapping before he was. Damn. I was definitely doing it before um, Kev was. Bistro was ahead of us and, you know, the Crash Crew was well known Mm -hmm. then. And so that's the hip hop history for me. So I was, uh, you know, I was one of thousands of kids that was doing it. So you got to remember by 79 in New York, hip hop in terms of people participating is like people doing a dance. Everybody did it. Yeah, yeah. There was some on some level, whether you was painting, dancing or rapping. Yeah. Well, yeah, but there were levels in terms of who you, how known you were. 
So mm. there was so so there were levels in terms of like they were superstars by that time. You know, mm -hmm. that would have been the Cold Crush Brothers. That would have been man. Do you remember breakup. punk rock rap? Like what a hit that was. Like I remember, like yeah. if you owned punk rock rap as a record, yeah. you you were cut above a whole bunch of people, man. You know, I remember that. But that's in the eighties, though, for us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, true. That, that, that's that, true. That, 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 that's because I'm still 80s. out here. I'm still right. out here, so I wouldn't have been around or seen none of what you're talking about. So when I moved out here, um, it's in the early 80s, and I moved out here not necessarily out of desire, but my mom moved to California. Okay. I stayed in New York, but because of my age, I was officially a California resident right. when I lived in New York. And which meant that I qualified for the low tuition at UC Berkeley. I was getting ready to go mm. to Howard. Howard didn't want to give, you know, I was going to have to pay $5,000 for Howard. Berkeley right. was 200 bucks. And so my that mom That is like, not a yeah. question. Yeah. So my mom was <laughs> like, you're going to go to Cal. And she exercised the California residency, yeah. which I was. Um, and that's why, that's how I went out there. When I moved out here, there were three things that I noticed. One, from a New York perspective, going up and down the East Coast, with the exception of DC, everybody was in awe of New York. So if you said you was from New York, it was kind of like New York City, wow. You so got the, props immediately, right? immediately. Like there was except, nobody who, except, go ahead, go ahead. Except so, when you went to Washington, DC. So DC had a kind of arrogance because it was Chocolate City. Right. So they were never ever in awe of New York. Right? That's it's kind of like, who cares? And that was <laughs> the first time I, I really ever experienced that. But from a New York perspective, um, you just thought everybody would, would be enamored with New York. So when I moved out here to the Bay, to Oakland, right? Oakland is a very special place because it's very independent. It don't care about New York. Right. And it was not, it was never an animosity thing. It was kind of like, was just oh, like, New York. It's like, yeah, you know, I have a cousin that lived there, but it never looked to New York still for town its biz. cues. Yeah, right. it, it never looked at. And I hadn't even heard of uh, town biz when I moved out here. Right, right. But Oakland also, and this is the point I'm getting at, never tried to be like L.A., which is the other epicenter in the country. People don't understand that still. The right. stylistic, the linguistic, the musical differences between the Bay and L.A. are massive, right. massive. Might as well be two different worlds. Totally. But the Bay was a very special place in that regard. So when I moved out here, I went to Cal. Mm. Um, I was emceeing and I didn't really appreciate it at the time until later when you know when first first time somebody heard me uh mc was at a party and it's like man you remind me of uh commander c and uh this other cat um i want to say they was out of richmond so there were people that were doing that had an expression of 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 what we could call Hip hop, but it, it some of it was influenced by Sugar Hill Gang, but there was also the gift of gab and people rhyming. So the way that people saw it is like, oh yeah, that's kind of like what the way my granddaddy used to do when he would talk to women. Right, you know? right, so, right. Just kind of like trying to do yeah, so, like yeah, yeah. So yeah. people kind of picked up on it that way. Um, so what I understood is that there was a music scene out here. Um, and it was based around funk. You know, this is something I come to appreciate later down the road. As um, opposed to like the breaks only, right? Like just, no, it was, had nothing to do with hip hop as I knew it, but there was a music scene that people were enamored with. And right, just the funk in. scene in general. Right. right, so I came out here and I'm hearing all kind of music and I'm like, what is this? And it's like, oh, that's Radiance. Who's this? Oh, that's Mass Construction. And, you know, mm -hmm. all these funk songs. I mean, you had your, Parliament and Knee Deeps and Rogers right. and Zap that we heard in New York, but there was a whole bunch of other stuff. True. that was like, man, what what the hell is this? And people was like, that was their thing, wasn't my thing. Right. Um, I came under the tutelage of this DJ on the campus. His name was Ben Gold. Okay. And so I got my start DJing um, through Ben when I was at Cal. Work. And um, and so that's when, you know, I was at all these parties that he did, all the big parties at Poly Ballroom, and he would let me rap at the end. 
Um, and by then, you know, by the time you get into 82, 83, you're starting to see that hip hop, as we know it from New York, is spreading. And that's when and, I would have came across the, the punk rock rap. Yeah, probably 84. Yeah. It, yeah, yeah, maybe yeah. it might have been 83, but yeah. Yeah. So so it was it was a it was a magical scene. Um but to go back to your question about writing, what what my family broke up, which is why my mom moved to Cali mm -hmm. and I stayed. Mm -hmm. And there was something that we didn't want to have happen, but she said, keep a journal write down your thoughts in a journal, said one day you'll need that because it may remind you of who you were. Interesting. So, so I wrote everything down. Now, at the time, I wasn't sitting there going, oh, this thing is hip hop. There was right. no, we weren't even calling it hip hop, to be honest. Right. right? So we, we called it the jams at the time. So, right. so there was no like, oh, I'm chronicling. I'm trying to keep records. It was like, this is what I'm going through. But I happen to be at the T-Connection. I'm going to meet my man, mm. Henry, at the T-Connection. Right. Oh, I saw a Grandmaster cast. So I just wrote what I was experiencing. That's so deep and beautiful, and, man. And Props that's to how your mom I, for that. For so, real. that so I have these journals that captured the moments. Wow. That journal was the basis for a, um, uh, um, what is it? Uh, not a thesis. It was the basis for my uh, final project, your theme paper. No kidding. Turn paper. Was the, yeah, yeah, turn paper, turn yeah. Paper with, a, with a professor named Roy Thomas. So he's the first one to see those writings. And he said, one day you need to write a book. You need to put this in a book. And, you know, it's like, yeah, okay. You know, never did. Right. But those journal entries, um, they then became the basis for my thesis, um, wow. which is what I graduated with. And the thesis was going to be parlayed into a book. And that book um, was ready to go to print or was getting close to mm -hmm. being ready to go to print. And somebody stole my car. I and remember when that happened, it, dude. Yeah. As a writer, I remember when you told me I almost cried. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That was a heartbreaking thing, bro. So they stole the car where I just happened to have the original copies and the backup copies. What I eventually found was a hard drive that had some of the workings of it. So I was able to kept and I had a, uh, a incomplete gallery copy of right. some of the books. And so, you know, th that those were things that I had. I still had all my journals, but the historian part is because I had the journals right. and I moved to Cali. So that means time froze for me. Mm. So meaning that, you know, I wasn't there. I wasn't evolving with the rest of my peers. So right. when I was like, oh yeah, I remember this party. I remember that. I, I oh, I wrote about this. Mm -hmm. And if I was to go back home, people would be like, oh man, wait a second. Man. Oh yeah, I guess we did. Yeah, because yeah, yeah, yeah. in a two or three year period, people going to college. Shifted, before, moved, people, to get in the army. Yeah. Yeah, you know so they're not thinking about it the same way. But um, yeah, so uh, a good part, you know, those became referencing points. And, right. uh, and then obviously I was involved pretty early on with a lot of stuff here. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there's a whole history of stuff that I was doing at Cal, um, the Day of Hip Hop. I did a couple of these and wrote these, you know, little pamphlets about what hip hop is and isn't did a song out there around the apartheid movement and uh and then man it was Alex. it was such a massive thing so first of all you are dropping crazy gems and i'm loving all this and i appreciate you sharing this wisdom no now, doubt one of the things that i that for me like everybody oh you know golden age of hip hop blah 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 everybody kind of has like a time that they think about or whatever you know, for me, for me in the Bay, my personal golden era was probably from like 1992 to like 2001. I'm still not even sure why I say that, but that's when to me, the most that I think I saw and experienced was really hitting me. The, 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 the thing about that, that I, that I remember the most was before they had hashtag hip hop ed, you know what I mean? Which was necessary and was happening, right? Everywhere. But the Bay was on another level, man. KRS-One at Stanford, 
uh, uh, Chuck D at SF State. Uh, one of the first times I remember meeting you was actually at UC Berkeley at an event that they had. WC was there with the Mad Circle. Sheena mm -hmm. Lester from uh, the LA Sentinel who went on right. the rap pages She's, was there. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, can you talk about um, some of the talks at that time? I mean, Stokely Carmichael was coming out. I mean, Kwame Tour, it was, it was going down. So, like, what do you remember? Kilu Nyasha, you know what I'm saying? Can you talk about so, so the political a, element inside hip-hop at that time, bro? Let's give a larger context to this. Do it, do um, it. One thing I want people to remember is that the golden era that is often described as, you know, the periods of 87 to maybe 92, 93. Right. You know, depending on who you talk to. Right, right. Is really personified by the emergence of three prominent groups. That would be Public Enemy, KRS-One, and X-Clan. X-Clan, straight up, yeah. But underneath it is, you know, an array of artists who represented consciousness. So there's two angles that you have to remember about this. And then I want to hit a third point um, that, that goes with this. If you go back to New York in the Latin Quarter, which is a preeminent club, keep in mind this word intentionality, mm -hmm. right? There's intention. So hip hop in many ways is is organic in terms of how it grows. I mean, right. how it emerges, but it's very intentional in how it grows. Meaning right. that there are people that say, we're gonna take this platform, we're gonna go from point A to point B. That would have been bam, back when we was coming up in the yeah. Bronx. Like we're going to do these things and we're gonna create a movement ab around it. So that's the first time you had that happening when they formed the Zulus and all that. Right. It was, intentionality right rock steady to, crew a lot of the right yeah but but more particular to infuse a knowledge and raise the consciousness yeah that was right, very right, zulu you right. know what i'm saying but even before that it's the ghetto brothers and it's the right. panthers trying to politicize ghetto them. brothers wow right. so so when you come to the latin quarter you have paradise yeah. who is a baby spade you okay. have uh uh, Lumumba, who is with Sonny Carson. Right. And they are looking at three things. There's an apartheid um, a resistance in South Africa. So it's like we need, we want to fight apartheid. And real quick, for the young people in South Africa, it was pretty much like slavery. Yeah. Right. Like fighting apartheid was a big deal. Go ahead. Yeah. Then you had um, a situation where people were getting their gold chains snatched because everybody's wearing these large gold chains. And shot. Well, they were getting, actually, in New York, they were getting cut. People would keep mm, a razor, yeah, blade, razor in their mouth, right? Mouth, and they would spit it out, and they would give you a scar. And a lot of the gold was coming from South Africa, so it's like, we need to fight this, and we need to stop mm -hmm. wearing these chains. And then the third thing that was happening was uh, the crack era was in full swing. Mm -hmm. Right. So you got to understand during the golden era, there's a crack era that is that is overwhelming everybody. So at the Latin Quarter, Paradise, along with some of these elders, Sonny Carson and them, the Black Watch decided to hold what they call meeting of the minds. And they're bringing everybody together, all the top artists at that time and in making commitments. They're like, look, this is what we're going to do. We're going to, for example, when we do our videos, we're going to put um, figures in the background that people could, you know, that we're going like to highlight. Like a picture them. of Malcolm X or a picture right. of MLK. So you see whoever. all these videos that come out like that. Right. Then there was a thing of like, we're, we're going to stop wearing these gold chains and we're going to put these um, medallions on. And because Dice had so much juice at the time, he could literally enforce it. It's like, you want to get on the stage in my club, you're going to take that those gold chains off, you're going to put on these medallions, right? Deep. And then it was also a way for them to stop the violence that was going on at yeah, the time. A lot of the predatory so, violence, for sure. So around this time, you had the emergence of this thing called Afrocentricity. So Dr. Leonard Jeffries, um, mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, um, Mufum, oh gosh, well, I'm always going to miss. Ivan Van Sertima. No, 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 not Ivan Van Sertima, but out of uh, Temple. Um, 
Malafi Ashante. Uh, Asante. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah, yeah, yeah. He's the one that really, I think. Malafi Asante. Yeah, yeah, Thank yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And then you have, um, so everybody's being told to read these books and catch her this and all that. That's happening in New York. In the Bay, because of the Afrocentricity, that's when you started to see the Kwame Torres and everybody coming mm -hmm, out here. Mm -hmm. So there was a consciousness raising here, yeah. right? And because the Bay is home of the Panthers, there was already yep. a politicization. So this is all happening around the same time, independent of each other. Nobody True. knows what's going on in the Latin yeah, Quarter. Right. But the point is, is that all of us were coming of age who were outside of the civil rights era. We're the children of the mm -hmm. civil rights and black uh, black power movements. Mm -hmm. So there's this like, well, let me do something. Oh, this is being reinforced because I'm hearing these groups yeah. who are coming out of New York who managed to get into the matrix and they're speaking truth to power. I'm going to speak truth, truth to power. And so you had a lot of consciousness raising that goes above and beyond just the music. Now, the other thing we got to remember, there were seven cities that really were hit with crack first. Mm -hmm. New York, Philly, mm -hmm. um, Los Angeles, mm -hmm. Miami, mm -hmm. the Bay Area, mm -hmm. right? So we're de dealing with the scourge. It's a very violent time. It's crazy Bay. violent, man. Right. The violence and, was out of pocket, yeah. So, so people are constantly trying to figure out how to raise the consciousness. So you have the new up, you have the upper room, and then later the new upper yeah, room. Yeah, the you upper know, so, room. So you have you have people that are around here, and remember, the Bay doesn't have to tap into New York. The Bay can tap into the legacy that it has of the Panthers here. and and, and the, yeah and, and everything free, that comes with uh, it. Right. So there's there's an, so it's like, oh let me go dig back. And there were elders that were around yeah. who you know like Akilu and Shasha and yeah yeah, yeah. right Meshi RIP and yeah. other folks that were able to lace people with information. Right. Yeah. This was ripe. So that golden era um there was an intentionality out here. There you know, was. as well. There was like people like we're going to use this platform and we're going to raise the consciousness. That would have been the upper room. Rafiq Bilal. And, man, Rafiq Bilal, know. rest in peace, man. Like what he did at that time was unbelievable because he had, I think, De La Soul came and played there. Uh, Last when Hyrule Poets. first blew up. Yeah. yeah. Last Poets. Karis one gave several lectures there. I mean, right. like it was crazy. Yeah. So so there was a lot of that going on. So part of it was generational. Mm -hmm. Part of it was looking at shared circumstances of mm -hmm. being ravaged by crack, which was being which was being accentuated by violence, being inspired to fight apartheid. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and free and, Nelson Mandela. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, for, yeah. Yeah. All that sort of stuff. So there was, you know, there were people that were tapping into their intellectual and cultural resources. So um, so it would not be far-fetched to see Boots Riley do, you know, the Mau Mau Rhythm Collective. Man, come on. Like it yeah. wouldn't be unusual to see, you know, uh, people doing these concerts where they're having talks before the concerts, right? Yeah, like you Paris know, and all that stuff. Right. You know what I'm saying? Remember, exactly. Digital Underground is out here. So yeah. you got to remember that Digital starts out as a public enemy type of group. They're not even called Digital. They called the Spice Regime, and they're wearing the berets, and they're talking That's about black right. power. You're and, right. And when you talk to Shock, he goes, "The only reason why we didn't do this was because Public Enemy emerges." Yeah, so, and they but had their to switch first, up. they switched up. But their first songs, "Your Life's a Cartoon," and all that, they were moving in that direction. That was but the who, first demo I heard from them too. "Your Life's a Cartoon." Oh my God! But look who comes out of digital, right? Tupac. So, Right. So, you know, Money B joins them first. Right. right? Because he's with a group called, Raw, well, it's not Raw Fusion, but it's MGM. Right. They're called MGM. But he comes into the group and his father's Ronald. Right. Yeah. His, and, yeah. His, fa his father uh, was a, a Panther. Former, former Panther. And, and, and his dad was one of the creators of the of the commemorator. Oh, that's right. Yeah, okay. Bobby McCall is one of Bobby, the yeah. as a commemorator, and he gave me my first writing gig. As a, that was my first column was in the commemorator. So there you have it. So you have that going on. Later, Pac joins. Yep. So you have two 
offspring the Panthers in a group called Digital Underground. So you have that, you have this conscious raising that's going on. Yeah. That's right there. So that's an important part. That's what makes it a golden era. Now let's flip it over a little bit more. There's still a street side to it. And within a street element, there's a certain type of brilliance going on there um, in terms of how people are kind of navigating that and how they're flipping things and mm -hmm. how they're establishing a whole hustle ethos. Mm -hmm. That becomes the backbone for the Bay. It comes out of the street, not on the conscious side. And it's important to understand it. The hustle comes out of the street mentality that everybody else picks up. And the one who personifies it the best in terms of taking it to the next level. Well, first, Too Short personifies it in 40 and them kind right. of like we're going to we're going to make a way out of no way. We're going to sell our totally. own product, right? Yeah. But the person who takes it to that next level is Hammer. Hammer. You know? And Hammer's doing some things that are way ahead of what, what's on people's radar. He is doing commercials. He's doing endorsements. He is part of that troop uh, uh, launching. And yeah, the true clothing line. Crazy. But, he, but him and his brother, Lou, are doing more than just uh they're doing more than just uh um being endorsers of a, a clothing product they're opening up stores in malls all around the country and i think when i talked to lewis burrell that's hammer's older brother mm -hmm. he said they might have had 30 or 40 stores that were just troop stores that was them that's the bay area that's hey, the was one of the biggest clothing lines in hip hop ever, probably the biggest first pure hip hop clothing line that I can remember. That, that got taken out by, and this is me, and I've told Hammer this on a number of occasions, I, I feel that it was competition, you know, uh, that came along and started spreading the rumor that it was owned by the Klan. Yeah, right? that ruined the brand. People right. said that True Clothing was owned by the Ku Klux Klan. And I remember, um, when they were doing Troop, Hammer and them brought out LL Cool J, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. So bring it full circle. My third gig, you know, um, before I even do BAM is with Hammer. I did his wow. first college marketing. I wrote his first bios. I wrote these wow. early pieces. I still have the booklet that we were sending around. So Hammer gave me that first like, like shot. You know, right. so and, and I learned a lot from him. Um, here's a funny story that 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 and this kind of emphasizes the Bay Area hustle. Yeah. There's a friend of ours, uh, early dancer, pioneering dancer. Well, second generation pioneering yeah. dancer. Um, but for our era, he would have been a pioneer because okay. many of us didn't really know about the movements in the 70s. But early on, his name is Damon Frost, rubber right. band man. Right. Right. And he had moved to Sweden. I'll never forget this. And so I'm telling him, man, this is dude, MC Hammer. He's blowing up, man. Boo, 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 man. Y'all need to get him out there. Mm -hmm. You know, he has his number one song. Mm -hmm. He's like, okay, well, let's meet him. Right. And uh, we go down to Hammer's house in Fremont. Mm -hmm. And we're waiting. And we're waiting. And we're waiting. And I'm like, man, I apologize. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hammer shows up. Nice car walks in the house and I'm like, Hammer, this is my man, Damon. This is the big house on the hill. No, no, this is before this. When okay. The, when yeah, still, early, early. He, right. Yeah, he's still, you know, he's still not nasty. Still ring him, ring him. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. ring so he shows up and he was like, uh, yeah, I just got back from KRON, which was NBC at the time. I just right. did a thing there. And he's like, so what are you, what are you going to do? He's like, yeah. He's like, I want to bring you out to Sweden, which would have been a big deal at the time. Cause who's flying you out to another country? Yeah. 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 I'm, yeah. Thinking, I'm like, man, I'm making moves. Come on. You, I'm brother. hooking you up dog. Yeah. He goes, yeah, man, I got 14 people in the crew. We're going to need first class tickets. I'm going to need $50,000. I'm like $50,000, you know, Damon doesn't even blink. And then he goes, look, I got to bounce. He gave us some records, shook our hands, and, and jetted. And I'm sitting there, and Damon goes, man, that dude got it. So he understood what Damon said. He's like, he knows his value. He's selling himself in a way that is letting you know, like, 
he's he's not going to settle for less, right? right. This was yeah. a hustle. The bar right? is high and you need to meet you, me there. You, you need to meet me there. And so, you know, at the time, keep in mind, you know, I mean, Run DMC might have did that because they were big at the time. Right. You just got your, your record's not even on the radio. Right. You're doing this? <laughs> he said your record's not even on the radio. But he <laughs> understood the way yeah. you got to hustle. Yeah. And then years later, you start to see other people, you know, Sway and Tech come to mind when yeah. they were damn near trying to keep the lights on in their house, but they were walking into the station and basically, like, uh, man, you got to have What's us. Up? You got yeah, yeah. to do the wake, wake up, up show. show, boy. <laughs> you know, and I remember the people at the station going, well, you know, um, Tech tells his story. He goes, he, the boss at the time, Keith Nafley, pulls out a piece of paper. He goes, let me show you something. He goes, you see this here? This is a circle, mm -hmm. right? This mm -hmm. is a circle here. And this here is you. This is this is this is this hip hop thing. This is this is what you guys are doing. Mm -hmm. This is your entire audience. So this is who we are reaching. This is you. And tech picks up the paper. He goes, Let me show you something. Starts drawing lines. He goes, This is us in the pond. We drop here in the center, and this is the way the that it hits effect. everything, the ripple effect. That's how that's one way they got that show. So the point that I'm getting at is that people were coming to the table with a hunger. People had raised consciousness. The yeah. backdrop was nobody wanted to fall victim to the yeah. crack thing. And those that came out of that life had a hustling ethos, and the two met wow. at various points in time. So people who like myself and others who are like, well, I'm, I'm definitely not going to be on the street, but man, let me do my own newsletter. Mm. Let me try to figure out to make a way out of no way. We were all encouraged to do That's for a self deep perspective, bro. And so when wow. you think about it, what comes out of the Bay, there's the Bay area beat report. There's the bomb magazine. There's the late Steph has her 40, newsletter, right? There's 4080, right. right? There's a lot of independent stuff. And when Unsigned you look at it, and hella broke, right, right. You know, living legends and all that. Yeah. Um, when you think about that, everybody understood that New York wasn't going to be on the radar. Well, the Bay wasn't going to be on the radar for New York. Right, for New York, word. Nobody was trying to be L.A., and so you had to do for self. And so there was an independent spirit that then gets informed either from street culture or from conscious culture. Like a Pan-African, right. Yeah, understanding right. that we're going to you are going to have to really do some bigger and better things for ourselves. And so that makes it a golden era in terms, and we're all coming of age. Right. right. You know, people are either in their late teens, maybe hitting 20. 20s, right. Yeah. Right. So, you know, nobody is sitting there and, you know, we're still fighting people going, what's this noise you're doing? What's this right. that you're doing? So you still have that. And if you're black in the Bay, you have another battle that's going on. So because the Bay had a scene and had an identity and had a, a cultural movement, people who adopted hip hop back then tapped in and built off of their cultural understanding. So mm -hmm. if short, just to use short as an example, short was like, well, I can play some instruments. I'm in a band. I'm going to have right. this funk sound. E-40 and them are, are in bands. Are in so bands, they have, yeah. They, they have live music. Kyrie from Young Black Brother. Kyrie. Right. Woo. Is doing, he's doing, I'm not sampling like Marley Marley. Dude, I thought play. he was going to be the next Dre. I can't front. Right. So he's, he's doing amazing. it. And Banks and all. So you have people that are bringing a musicology mm -hmm. to the, to the, to the, to the, to the game that is based upon the funk. Yeah, that they grew up with. So that's one thing. The second thing is that they're confident enough to know that I don't need to try and sound like Rakim, who by now is the preeminent yeah. prototype for right. where people are going to go. Right. It's like, I'm going to go to a sideshow and I need something that's going to rattle and represent yes. my car. So the Bay for me was one of the first places where people kept their accents talked about what they knew right and and just did it now 
I said black folks in the Bay, whether they're from San Francisco with oh, the early people that's coming right. out over there, Oakland, Vallejo, they all have a thing that from a New York perspective, they said, that ain't really hip hop. That's not right. true. That's country sounding. They always, that was the first thing I heard when, when Easy E came out, even I remember they go, man, yeah. we don't like Easy. He sound like he's from, from the country. I was like, what? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> well, now let's go back to this a little bit more. Mm -hmm. You also have a large urbanized population of people outside the black community, a lot of Asian folks, right. hip white folks. They're getting into hip hop, but they're soaking it up wholesale. They're like, I watch Beat Street. I'm putting on the jacket. I'm going to do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I got you the have parachute pants. <laughs> you, well, no, no, not the parachute because they're following New York to the T. They are right. carbon copies of New you're York. Right. I see what you're saying. Right. So you got and your so, carbon copies from New York versus. So now you have indigenous black expression that is meeting imported New York. Mm. style expression, but it's being soaked up primarily by people who are removed from the hood or it's being people outside of the hood, non-black folks. Yep. So you had a phenomenon of non-black people pointing to artists like Too Short and E-40 and saying they're not real hip hop. Mm. Now think about that for a minute. You are coming from a community that has similar conditions that gives birth to black expression. And you got people removed telling you that your stuff is not real, it's not because, real. because you're picking up an aesthetic that isn't natural to, you know, folks who lived here. There ain't no now, subway. Dude, did you understand that at the time or how did you perceive yeah, it I, at the time? I, 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 I understood that. I understood that because I, I, I saw early on mm. that this was, there was a uniqueness. And I'm, I'm going to tell you a story about this in a minute that involves KRS. Okay. But, but, but what I understood, you know, because now I'm here, I'm from New York and I'm like, these folks ain't thinking about New York. They got their own <laughs> yeah. thing. They are not they, trying they, to be they, like, they're, they're, they're not, it's not even right. on the radar. It's years later, you start to understand it's a richer, richer history. So Ricky Vincent mm. was always talking about the funk, the funk, yeah, the funk. Yeah, he was, right? always. But, you know, it's, it's, it's then soon that kicks in. Now this makes sense. Okay, now I understand what he's talking about. Right. But you had a, a city that's like, we do our own thing. And there are several cities around the country that kind of do that. Houston and Detroit are very similar in that sense True that they're life, like, yeah. like, you know, Chicago's right down the road. Yep. Detroit is like, we're Detroit, right? Yeah. You, know, you got all this Chicago gang structure, not in Detroit, right? LA has their gang structure, but not in the Bay. It's everywhere for else. But real, it's, for it's not real. Bay. So there was an understanding where people early on got their own voice and spoke it the way and did it the way that they felt they needed. This didn't mean that people didn't have lyricists and all that. We did have yeah, all yeah, that, yeah, but there was, but there was also an, an aesthetic that was funk based that people stuck with and, and, and they wrote that and they blew it up and they, and they incorporated it in their expression. So that is very, very important. Um, I bring all this up to say, and I think you had asked a question earlier, but I'm going to come back to it a minute. Yeah, no, it's all good, but I'm, I'm, I'm just soaking up game plan. Do you. But when you look at everybody who's coming out, right? right. Paris, mm -hmm. 40, mm -hmm. short, mm -hmm. all of them have musicianship yeah. because what, what, pre, what they come out of is an era of band culture. So yeah. when we were in New York in the 70s, we had crews, five or six member crews. There were like four, right. five people in our crew, a DJ, three right. MCs, and right, right. Other, a dancer, other maybe. Like, right, right, right. Yeah. At the same time, you had all these people in garage bands, hundreds of people around here, right? And I remember talking to Shorts, uh, one of Shorts old producers, Al Eaton, because mm -hmm. he was part of that band culture. Al Tommy. Eaton, hey. Yeah. Forster McElroy, right? So yeah. what you what you start to a pre time X social club, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All of this comes out of Jay King and them. They Jay all come King. out of they all come out of band culture. That's the word I'm using. Yeah. The band culture is is locked into funk. Yeah. And so 
so there's a reason why you had a certain type of expression, musical expression that was going to, you know, speak to yep. the desires of a group of people that's coming from the hood. Now, I'm going to close this out this way. Go. KRS-One comes out to the Bay when he had the Sex and Violence album. Right. And I'm taking him around, and he's going on and on about, you know, all this stuff. I think he was referring to 40. He's right. like, man, you know, Dave, this is not real hip-hop, you know, like – in the hood is where hip hop is happening. Now he's in San Francisco, so he's seeing a lot right. of non hood people into right. it. He's at the station. He's, right. You know, there's is no black people at the station. Maybe me, Rennell, and Sway. You know, so right, right, right. Like in Brooklyn, that's when the hood is right. where hip hop lives. So we were coming to the East Bay. I said, I'm going to take you somewhere. So I took him to Tiwa Uzi's, which was Tiwa Uzi East, Records, boy, which is in East Mont Mall. And that's about as hood as you can get. Hey. And I remember uh, Thurman and um, gosh, why well, I'm forgetting the other brother's name. They're there, and so that's why I know- bought Malcolm X's No Sellout. That's why I. Bought oh wow! Him. So they know him. Yeah. You know, they're, they're like, yeah. oh snap, yeah. you're the guy from MTV, right? So yep. they recognize him. And I told him, I said, I'll give you twenty dollars for everybody who buys your album. And people are coming in. You look like, oh, yeah, how you doing, man? I like your stuff. Let me get that MC Ant. Let me get Pooh Man. Mm -hmm. Let me get Ascari X. Mm -hmm. People were buying in the hood artists that that they could relate to. That Ray Love. Right. Well, Ray Ray. Love wasn't out at that time. Later. Yeah, 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 later. So this didn't mean that they didn't like KRS. Didn't mean that they didn't appreciate it. But there was somebody who spoke more directly to them. Right. So the the example I use is like the message broken glass everywhere. People pissing on the steps like I just don't care. We could all relate to that and go, wow, you're speaking about life in urban America. But when you get too short, who comes out and he's talking about, you know, sunny side and he's naming blocks off in Oakland, you go, the message is good. But this guy here, he's actually talking about my neighborhood. Yeah. So let me hear what he got to say about my neighborhood. And then if you look at it and go, I like that, but he's playing this Roger and Zap type of sound that I can relate to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So hip hop really at its essence, at least in terms of the music, even the dance and everything, speaks to the cultural legacy and rhythm of a particular group of people who shared the same conditions of being oppressed, locked out, ignored, overlooked, and marginalized. And so... The phenomenon, which I always remember, of non-black people telling black people that their stuff is not real, not real, based upon a New York aesthetic. And remember, people would come out from New York and they're like, man, this is what we do. And oftentimes they had non-black people embracing them and saying, this is great. And they're sitting at Yo. their feet in awe, like, I want to do this. But when you went to the hood, people weren't necessarily in doing awe. that. Yeah. And they weren't because, doing it in the same way, even if they because were. now. Now comes the other thing about hip hop. It's not a spectator sport. It's a participatory sport. Come on, man. If you get, if you start rhyming, I'm rhyming with you. You start dancing, I'm dancing with you. Right? You know, we may watch for a little bit, but you know, after the second time, (laughs) I'm getting, you know, (laughs) I'm getting in. I'm getting in. I'm getting in. You know, like he's good, (laughs) but I got something to say as well. So what you have is, any of those artists that come out, unless it was like a public enemy speaking consciousness where you're like, I'm learning. If you was just doing the activities, sooner or later, people's like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get in there too. Yeah, you know, absolutely. You know, so high. I'm not necessarily like trying to soak up everything. It's more like, you got this dance, let me show you my dance. Right. You know, you're doing this, I got a movement too. Oh, yep. you fl- Let me flow too. And think about it. Now let's go back. Think about how many artists have come to the Bay and found out the hard way that you better, you better be on point or people will literally disrupt your show. Hey, think about it. Do you remember what happened when quick came out here? Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. But (laughs) but, yo, but but, hold on. Why did, this is my only good question. When, when that happened to, now that happened in daily city. That didn't right. happen, right? That yeah, but, but it was all Frisco folks. 
it was all Frisco folks, <laughs> but, but, you know, you know, for people who don't know, Quick came to the Bay. Um, his crew was on stage. They started shouting out a gang set, and people just disrupted the place because it's not, it's not yeah. that. It's not a Crip yeah. blood, you know, thing. I actually talked to Quick the next day about that. Did you, know? you really? Yeah, wow. yeah. I mean, they understood. You know, they right. they got it. Um, you know, but here's the deal. And this is what I'm getting at: is yep. that folks here. Not so much that they wanted to disrupt because they just wanted to tear stuff up. It's like, dude, I can do that. I can do that too. You know, yeah. this is good, but you know, like, it's, I can say. So let me let me say something, because for for a period of time, people were very resentful of hearing all the New York stuff when people had something to say in Oakland and the Crest and all the in Richmond and all that. People had their own flavor. And so it was like, dude, you ain't the only one that can do this here thing. The New York perspective would be like, I'm here to show you. Dude, no, nah, we already got our thing here as well. That was a and, big deal. And that was a big deal. So hip hop is always reflective of the community that it came out of. And, and should so, be. And should be. And even for those non-black folks who soaked it up, that's reflective of where they were too. Right. Because they might not have had the same musical lineage to get back on. So this was their access thing. to the people that did. Yeah. Right. So they're like, well, I've seen this on Beach Street. Let me let yeah, me blow like, it up this way. You know what I'm saying? Like, Somebody else is like, <laughs> well, we don't dance like that. We kind of dance like this. So we're going to stick to that. Yeah. And at the end of the day, it's beautiful. And I'll close with this. Mm. Remember, I told you about D.C., Right. I said D.C. Mm -hmm. was like from a New York Whatever. perspective, D.C. Right. was the only people that was like arrogant, like right with just Washington, D.C., Chocolate City. Right. What is in D.C. at the same time as hip hop in New York in the 70s? Go, 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 go. Hey, I got it Perc right. <laughs> I'm so happy. Percussion based music. Right. Appeals to a young audience. They right. all know how to play instruments. Hella drums. They locked, they, they locked in. That's the thing to this day. Now, this of course, day. there was some there was go go break beats that we picked yeah, up, yeah. and there was some go go artists that rap. But if you go to DC, there's a whole infrastructure that you know. You talk to folks it's like, oh, I remember going to the Rare Essence concert. I remember, yeah, you know, yeah, they yeah, have yeah, all. Yeah. I remember seeing hearing the Mickey song. I mean, it was it, it's its own thing. That's real. You go bro. to Chicago, you know. By the time you get to the late 70s, right, they have their own DJ base culture that is house. When I talk about for older people, talk about our peers, they're like, man, this is what I'm into. Hip hop comes late for them. House is there, is mm -hmm. what we're down with, right? Detroit, when you look at them, their techno sound with Juan Atkins and Jeff hey. Mills. And the group Cybertron, yeah, because they were signed to a Bay Area label when they got distribution, Fantasy Records. Many of us thought that sound we associated it with hip hop. Clear, totally, totally but, clear. But I if you clear was yeah, a hip hop true. record, right? But if you talk to Juan Atkins and them, it's like this is uh, we're doing techno. Yeah, that's true. So, but if he was the, in the Bay when Clear came out, every hip hop was, party was, right. ready. One, one, two, two, right. Three, it was a hip hop four. thing, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, crazy. so I think you you see that you're 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 in in the UK now, and you know it's rich history. Eventually, Man. people found their voice. It's like it's nothing wrong with us having and our. And that's accent. what grime is right now out right, here. That's grime, like right. if you check the grime scene out here, hey, there's a. Hey, I'm gonna send you this track I just heard the other day. Uh, my lady was playing a car. It's called Informa. It's like I N F A R M A. It's not like E R. Right, it's right. Inform Yo, Informa is hard. Oh, I'm sure, but the UK, Yo. but the UK has always had that, and before that, it was drum and bass. Yes, yes, metalheads, so, all the, right. the the goldies. You know so you saying? go around. The question is, you know, we often ask where hip hop is in different places, but the other question we got to ask: what is the equivalent to hip hop in these places too? Because if you look at it from the standpoint of black expression versus a particular name, mm. 
mm-hmm. and a, a rigid set of activities, mm-hmm. it'll open up a world to you. And you'll right. be like, oh, wow. So now let's let's close this out. I know I've been yeah. saying it, but let's close this point out. Yeah. So the beauty of the Bay is that there were Black expressions that some of which we can associate with and have been associated with hip hop. Mm-hmm. But it was very unique to the Bay Area because it spoke to the needs and wants and cultural acclamations of a group of people who were being marginalized and left out. So there was band culture and alongside that band culture was dance culture. So we all now know, you know, going all the way back to the seventies and sixties, there was, you know, the, the robot strutting boogaloo aspect that comes out of there. Right. And there's a long history, you know, the black resurgence, Boogaloo bill, all these people. So that's an important history that later down the road, we go, Oh, we're going to umbrella it under hip hop, but it was its own thing. If you go down to LA and you have the locking and you have uh, have, lock and all of them, but you also had roboting down there and they yeah. had their own At Venice beach. You, you, yeah, I'm talking about in the sixties, right? right? You have their own musical expression, right? Then you go, Oh, okay. This is what they did for particular reasons. Mm-hmm. And you can find that in every city. Now, just like hip hop in the seventies was not called hip hop. It definitely wasn't called hip hop here it was, you know, we right. dancing, we have talent right. shows, you know, whatever name yeah. they had for that yeah. movement. Every black community has these expressions. And so just not so much to try and play a game of who was first and who was second. Right. Because that can get played out. But I know what you're yeah. saying, though. I do. You want to see the beauty of man. I want to know how you got down. I want to. Right. So when I go to the UK, I want to know what their musical legacy is. And they may go, oh, it comes, it's a mixture of reggae, mm-hmm. uh, but it's also a mixture of indigenous stuff out of different countries in Africa. Yo, and Diana, we fused whatever. it together. Yeah. And then we live in the big city. And then we get this thing called hip hop because nothing nothing exists in a vacuum. So we took this piece, we added that piece, we did this. Yo. And the next thing you know, we have something that is going to be unique to the UK, but very different than France, which is right across the channel. Exactly. Yeah. Because France will have its own set of things. And you're looking at France, you got Africans, you got Arabs. So there's going to be some mixture there, just like the sound in New York is going to come from Mambo. Yep. um, Slash Boogaloo, Latin Boogaloo, Latin Jazz. Latin Jazz for sure. So meaning, meaning our drum beats or break beats, we could get down with a particular rhythm. We can get down to a Tito Puentes. Yeah. Let me play Tito Puentes in the 1980s in Oakland. Cats would have been like, what the hell is this? Right? Even the Mexican cats would have been like, what the, what, 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 what are you doing? I mean, it's cool, but you know what I'm yeah. saying? Like, yeah, it's yeah, cool, yeah. but that's not our sound, right? Meanwhile, in New York, people would have been like, that's our jam. Hey, yeah, hey, yeah. Hey, you know but then when you go, let me put on this 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 uh Roger in Zap, mm-hmm. and then let's go a little bit deeper. Let's get Roger's brother, you yeah. know. And you know, people in New York go, Roger's brother, who did what? Let's get into <laughs> this. Let's get into brother. this, let's get into this B-side <laughs> cut from from uh 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 um cool in the gang, right? Yeah. Then you're gonna have people that go, we get down with that because that's our rhythm. Yeah. And I think, you know, ultimately hip hop allows us the opportunity to explore deeper into our history, cultural history, and really Man, recenter re, re, and, and really recenter ourselves because one of the things about hip hop, it emerges, one of the cultural reasons it emerges is because what we were, the places that we went to get cult, cultural nourishment from had diluted itself. It was like black radio in New York was like, we're going to play the Bee Gees now. And yeah. we're going to play, we're going to play this John Travolta disco. <sighs> right. So in New York, you got to remember the irony of knowing that if you lived in the Bronx, it was very segregated. 
you could right. not go past certain neighborhoods without having a problem. Right. So Arthur Avenue, the Riga Avenue, Pelham Bay, these were, you know, white boy enclaves, you know, Italian. Mm -hmm. Like if they saw you, there was a problem. It was kind of probably going to be on. More than on. You were going to be chased and, you know, it's going to be a really big beat. problem. Right, right. Yeah. So the irony of seeing these same people who were always calling you the N-word are now dancing to John Travolta. Right. You know, like, so when I seen that, that storyline, and I seen those characters, there was no love there. It was like, man, fuck them dudes. You trying to like, take my shit, fool? No, 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 no. <laughs> that wasn't the vibe? No, not that you're taking our stuff. Fuck them dudes because you don't like us, right? So it wasn't like you're stealing our stuff. Right. I don't want, we don't want this BG stuff. That's not us. That, right. That's watered down disco. That's that's that's, a, was that's, that's not that's not our stuff. Right. The, the real disco that watered that John Travolta disco that was at Studio Fifty Four, where they didn't even want black people in there unless you was Michael Jackson. Hey, that's hella deep. You just yeah. broke down a jewel. Oh my god, about Fifty Four and that whole right. vibe. Yeah, See, because they were I doing wasn't the, there. I don't think about it like that. Where they were doing exclusivity. Uh, you can come in Adisa, but your homegirl can't. Right. Oh, no, your homegirl can come in, but not you. Going to sit outside. Yeah, you're yeah. going to sit outside. They were doing that exclusive thing, right? But you know where, like my older cousins, who were DJs, who weren't into hip hop, but was into this raw, yeah, unbridled black expression. They went to Paradise Garage, which opens up at the same time. They get behind Larry Levan, where mm. their music is raw and funky. Ain't no BGs going on there. Right. We're talking about all this, you know, Crown's Heights affair and oh, just just music that if you listen to the Larry Levan tapes, you'd be that's funky. And this became Paradise Garage, which gives birth to New York club music. By the time you get into the eighties, hip hoppers from New York are at Paradise, even with the gay crowd that it, right, it right. grew standing right alongside because Larry LeVan was popping, the speakers right. were popping, and it's like, that's you. You do you, I'm going to do me. But that that wow. gives birth to Frankie Knuckles, who goes to Chicago and then brings you house. right? But what we're talking about is raw black expression, cultural, musical expression that has all these different tentacles. And when you go from place to place and see how it emerges, you know, bounce music here and right. you know, Miami bass there. And then right. it changes with each, you know, every couple of generations. So by the time we're coming up, it's gangster rap. It's yeah, G-Funk, right? Then it's hyphy for us and it's trap for, or yeah. crunk. Or crunk, and, and, exactly. Right? And screw and all these other yeah. things. That's the beauty of hip hop is being able to see all these different things. Man. God bless you for all this wisdom. Now, we would be remiss. I would be unmindful if we didn't talk about Can't Stop, Won't Stop. Okay. You know what I'm saying? The new version, getting ready to drop with you and Jeff Chang. Can you talk about um, how you and Jeff came together on, on this, this, this release? Yeah. And can you talk about what, what you guys, how, how you approached it differently? Me and, Jeff went, me and Jeff went to Cal together, so we go back a long, long ways. Mm -hmm. um, we mm -hmm. often joke about who's older, you know, so if he was on the show, it'd be like, Dave, my big brother, but Jeff is my big brother. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have that type of thing in friendship. Um, when Jeff was writing his book, I remember he was doing all this research and he changed the paradigm in terms of how you were going to tell the story. The story usually started from the standpoint of the three seminal figures, Flash, Bam, and Herc. Right. And you know, and they were always talking about the gang life that right. preceded it. And Jeff decided to research that. And he, you know, he writes about the peace treaty mm -hmm. and goes back to the ghetto brothers. So now you had to look at what was leading up to it. And those are important stories to understand because it, it definitely lays these groundwork. Right. Uh, so when he wrote his book, you know, my book was going to come out before him. And in my book, I, I have remember. a lot of aesthetics. And then it got stolen and, it, and right. then his thing came out. So I remember him saying, it's like, man, I wish your book had came out first because now for me to have put it out the way it was, it would have been like, you know, Jeff had changed the game <laughs> in right. a lot of ways. Right. So he always wanted to do something. And so on the 15th anniversary, he said, we're going to do a rewrite. We're going to target a younger audience. 
um, you know, I want you to be a co-author in this. So, so dope, man. So what we did was we tried to fill in a lot of the gaps from the first one. Mm. So there's robust chapters on women. Uh, we take it all the way up to George Floyd and the pandemic. It was actually supposed wow. to come out last June. But because of the pandemic, we said, well, it makes no sense to do that. So right, why don't we just, why don't we, might as well just write about what's going on now. So we got mm. Black Lives Matter, the pandemic, uh, George Floyd, all that. Um, you know, we, we kind of, we don't de-emphasize the politics. It's still there. It's pretty right. strong. It's right. It, it but can't, we, yeah. But we add a lot of, a lot of other stuff. We take a lot of the stuff from my book and put it in there. That's and so Jeff cool, a, man. Yeah. And so, you know, Jeff is a beast in terms of what he's able to get in. Right. Uh, the challenge we had is what we couldn't get in. Mm. So let me give you, let me give you a thing. Cause uh, I'd never knew this. Um, you know, you got 300 pages and if we put something in, we got to take something out. <laughs> well, okay. Well, That's we got this. That is the historian's dilemma. Is that not a hard thing? I dealt with that when I was doing a thing in Oakland at the museum because there were things, because I'm like, yo, this needs to be in, but then you've only got 10,000 square feet. You've only got, right? And so right. Yeah, yeah, I totally understand. So you got to always find ways in which to do things. So right. there, there were little things that we did that, you know, that was, you know, nods to certain, you know, to, right. to kind of extend it. But there were three things that we had to do. Um, well, first of all, here's how this dilemma plays out. There's a story that I was sitting on for a long time and it, it has to do with the emergence of gangster rap. So a lot of people don't know in Detroit, a group of police officers formed a rap group called OCC out of control cops. Mm -hmm. And they did a 14 song album called diary of a killer cop where they talk about killing people. So this is an actual rap group. And there's a group in Chicago of cops who form a rap group called the Slick Boys and they pattern themselves after the Panthers. And they even put out a book with a 10 point platform of how to clean up the community. No. The pair, yeah. So the pair go on Jerry Springer and they have a full on fist fight on Jerry Springer. And the tape is gone. You can't find the tape anywhere. Jerry Springer will swear it didn't happen, but it actually did happen. Right. So I'm like, we got to put this story in here. Dave, you know, that tape in Detroit sold like 3,000 copies. Nobody knows about it. We could put it in, but then maybe we need to take out the story about Rosa Clemente running for vice president, which you want to put in. Um, if we take this story out about, you know, Adisa battling crazy legs right, you know, right. in his backyard, then we got to take out this whole thing about Shaw Rock. Right. Which you want to do. You know, what do you want to do? You know, but so, I won that battle with crazy legs. I won yeah, but then, yeah, but then he's like, you know, will your daughter know who Adisa is? Right. It for her. Right. 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 So you, you have all these different things. If we if we if we put this thing in, then we got to take out this whole section about Ferguson. Right, man. And so it was all these things. And so it was like it was like a lot of, you know, so these were hard things that you had to look at. Um and I mean, it's good. It's a good book. It covers a lot of ground. I know it's going to be a good book because I mean, but, shoot, look at both y'all Voltron up. That's crazy. Yeah. And that's the other thing, because I have a lot to say, but you're still talking about a beast of a writer, which is Jeff. Dude, Jeff you know, is so, savage. Yeah, 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 right. So, so, you know, so it's like, yo, I got all these things. And Jeff is like, well, you, you do know, you know, right. I'm kind right. of like Michael Jordan in this place, you know, yeah, he, he can cross him up in the yeah, paint. Yeah. Yeah. He, he so, you know, so have a seat, Kobe, because, you know, I'm still MJ. on this. <laughs> so it, it's good. You know, um, we did an international thing. Um, but I would say this. The book, this will be the last time you can actually go down the path that we did with the book. You know, to go back into the history, back to the pioneering days, there will be two pieces of work that come out that go a little bit more in depth. Yeah. Uh, DXT and Charlie Rock, who I quote a lot in the book and is a buddy of mine, they have a project coming out and Debbie Deb has one coming out, right? Oh, wow. Okay. So those pioneers will tell their story in a way that would make sense for them. Right. But we're not going to be able to go back there anymore. People are what really hungry. About? People are really hungry for 
things that are generationally based. Yeah. And they also want to know, you know, like, what's the story of Detroit? What's the story of the Bay? What's the story Agreed. of Miami, right? So Houston, we, we, right. You know, we tap into that a little bit, but it's more of like a baton. Right. right. So we're like, look, there's a dance scene here, the Black Resurgence. We talk about that, right? We we talk about Houston, but it's not, it's not meant to go we, like we. It's right? not intended to be the deep dive. No, that's somebody. Right. It's a handoff. We gave right. you the groundwork, pick that up and run. Handle with it. it. Yeah. Um, the way that the book is now is like jazz. If you talk about the history of jazz, most people will start with Miles Davis and they'll go back to Coleman Coltrane and, and, right. and all that. They're coming out of the bebop era, right. 1959. Right. They're not talking about Buddy Bolden and Sidney Boucher and the Dixieland jazz, right. band, the, the Dixieland jazz band and all that from the 1920s right. and the teens. Right. It's like, eh, no, nah, we going here. So right. now, you know, in a couple of years, the nineties is 30 years ago. The golden right. era you talk about is 30 years ago. Word. Right? So people weren't even born. People are born in the 2000s. Dude, right? I'll give you an example. I talked to a guy right now. He's a co college student at, uh, his name is Jerron. And so Jerron right. is over there at, at, at Howard Law. Uh, my homegirl Carla mentioned the far side to him, right? You know, they were such a big, you know, the far mm. side. And he was like, I was born four years later. Yeah. He was born four years later after passing me by. Right. I mean, so he was so, juiced, but this is a real thing, what you're speaking to. Totally. But think about that whole 90s era, right? Yeah. You know, because you got far side, you got this West Coast aesthetic. Yeah. You got, you got uh, a reemergent. You got a whole different. Uh, Good life cafe. You got all that. So there's a whole history there. And it's an important one. And it shapes policy. It shapes politics. It, sh it shapes cultural aesthetics. Um, and that's, you know, and that's going to be important history for us. We wanted to make sure that there was a record mm -hmm. for people to go back. Like, like I said, you know, this is probably going to be the last time you can go into that. Well, right. That, that's a really and, good and, point. And people yeah. need it. And people need uh, a younger audience needed to have it. Like it's here. Here's mm -hmm. the foundation um, so that they can understand why the Afrocentric period emerges so that you can right. understand why, because you have to understand about the Watch Rebellion, which we write about. You have to understand about, you know, the politics of abandonment and benign neglect and the role yep. that Nixon and yep. uh, Robert Moses, though, you have to understand that to really get a grasp of what emerges up here. But In a couple of years, you're going to have to really understand Rodney King. That's true. You're going to have to really understand the crack era and its aftermath and its resistance to it in the 90s moving forward to understand Ferguson. Hey, man. You don't need to watch Rebellion to understand Damn, Ferguson. Damn, homie, you, you are over here dropping jewels on him, son. The mathematics well, Dave. King well, Dave out here. I don't know about that. Ooh, I'm serious, but it, but, man. But, that, it, but that's important. That generational piece is crucial. Yeah. I agree. So, yeah. So, you know, like, so we're giving it the last time. And then, and then it's other people that are really, really, you know, they're real good friends. Um, we build all the time that have gone really, really deep. So, you know, Jay Kwan, right? Man, Jay Kwan is amazing. His, his work, Mark Skills' his work. And, Mark Skills and, is a savage. Right. And then, of course, you know, then there's our secret weapons, which would be like, you know, uh, Red Alert, who has photographic memory and Charlie Rock, you know, so these are our elders. Mm -hmm. And so these are, you know, these are folks that I check in with, like, you know, like if I go, well, I was at perfect example. I was talking to Charlie and I might be like, yeah, you know, um, uh, I was making fun of. Total's record when she mm -hmm. did when they did the song Total, uh, the rock group when they did um, um, Georgie Porgy. Right. It's like, ah, oh, man, who the hell wants to listen to that? You know, the best Georgie Porgy was MC Light. And then it was followed right, right. by uh, George Bennett. And he's like, well, Toto had Georgie Porgy first. So they nobody ever listened to goddamn Georgie Porgy from Toto. And then he's like, well, when Disco King Mario that was his main record. 
Huh? And then you're like, what? And he starts to give those stories, like, so, you know, like, and then after he played Total, then he would play. So, you know, these are people, these were their elders. So they're yeah. there. On a, on, they're there in 74 and 75. So, deep. So, so there's an understanding that, you know, like you don't know it unless you're absolutely there. And they have that photographic memory to be there. So they're the elders to some of those pioneers. Um, so we, you know, we always talk and they, they give like a lot of jewels and gems. Yeah. Uh, and so for them to tell their story will be good in the sense that now it's almost almost autobiographical. Yeah, you know, like man. I talked to DXT, you know, yeah, you know, like I was talking to them about band culture and DX was like, you know, my daddy was, you know, um, a band band leader. And wow. we actually had a high school band in Edenwall where he's from. Right. Oh, so that's a whole other thing. Now, Dang, of course, right. that bandmanship didn't have anything to do with us in Soundview or anything like that. But it's an important aspect that I think they'll be able to dig deeper into. But I think we 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 lay that baton. And man, that very, is beautiful, man. So we were very strategic about it. So, you know, it's like, okay, I know you're all coming out. Let me make sure. I Let me let me, let me me rewrite this and put this quote and say this came from Charlie. So when you hear his name, yeah, you'll, you'll know. be like, you'll be like, oh, okay, I, I, I read about this. Now let me build with what you got to say. You know, so it's like Jay Kwan, you know, the, and they know like Jay, man, I'm, I'm yeah. going gonna, gonna to quote this. But this is the reason why, because I know you, you know, I know the projects that they got coming out. And yeah. it's like, you, we need to make sure that people go, you that guy that was. Yeah, no, that's beautiful, man. And I mean, that's how I think, you know, it's 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 a beautiful thing to be a custodian of history. You know what I mean? It's yeah. a beautiful thing to be a culture keeper, but it's also a hell of a responsibility. And it can be very scary and it can be very sad sometimes when you recognize certain people won't get in that you know did something or certain aspects won't yeah. get covered that you know should be. But again, man, I want to thank you so much for being on Bishop Chronicles, man. Um, yeah. Tell people how to holler at you. Where can they track you down if they want to learn more? You know? All right. So my, my handle on all social media is Mr. Davey D M R D A V E Y D. So that's my Instagram. That's my Facebook. That's my Twitter handle. That's my Twitch page. Um, that's my mixed cloud page. So you can catch me DJing yeah. a lot of these spaces. Don't mix is on mixed cloud, by the way. Don't sleep on those mixed cloud mixes. Thank you. So that's, that's where you catch me. Um, the book actually drops on the 15th. So we moved it back a couple of weeks. Okay. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be doing a lot of conversations. And, you know, we have a whole strategy behind that to, to really kind of, we understand it's going to be a bigger dynamic to it. So yeah. we're kind of laying that groundwork and, you know, like I call it baton passing, you know. Yeah, yeah. So that people know like, okay, this is what's happening. You know, take advantage. Um so that, you know, this doesn't lay on the thing. I'll also say this. Mm. History is being unfairly rewritten. And so that is happening as we speak as well. So there's, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Make it plain, Black man. Make it plain. Yeah, so, so that is going to be a challenge <laughs> of... That's going to be a challenge. And I, I hope that folks are clear that it's not about who came first because history is not linear. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a cylinder. Mm -hmm. And what's going on here, something else is going on there mm -hmm. at the same time. And there's constant back and forth and influences and all that. If you get caught up in the linear game, you're going to lose. Like we came first and this came second and that came. Right. Not with black people because black people innately express themselves with a cultural aesthetic that we all have with drum bass, for example, that would be our aesthetic. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. We have an oral tradition. That would be our aesthetic. Yeah. Um, we're community driven. Our, our art it's not art, it's expression. So it, it's about community. You rap, right. I'm rapping. You sing, I'm singing. It, it, right. We're not a commodity. You know, it's like your, your mama sang. Mm -hmm. She can't sing a lick, but mm -hmm. she's singing at church. We all singing, right? Mm -hmm. So you got to understand, in particular, Black expression is that, and it clashes 
with an industry that wants to commodify. So we come into the church, the whole church gets down, but we just want you. Right. But what about my mama? No, no, <laughs> we just want you. And then something gets lost in the commodification because it's, it's about community and not individual yeah. accolades, even though there are some individuals that have done good things, but even those individuals that have done good things, it's still a result of community that, right. that brings it to the forefront, whether it's Rakim and what he does. Yeah, but your community's jazz. If right. there's no bebop era and there's no swing to the music, right. you don't have your flow. Right. You, you're you coming out of that community. If it's E-40 and his his music, you came out of a band at Grambling College is based upon that. Right. Yeah. It's based upon Hell group real. aesthetics yeah. that you were able to pick that up and then individually mimic that. But when you think about it, you had to be situated in a scene that looked to you and said, you're from the hillside of Vallejo and we're from yeah. the crest of Vallejo. So we yeah. all hear together that's what makes it happen or doesn't make it happen um and so you know I, I want us to collectively take advantage of that understanding because what we're up against are people that want to isolate it mm. bishop we don't need the bay we just need you right no, you're, you're a product of 40 or 50 come years on, of man. collective yeah. struggle come on man you Word. know you, there's if there's there's no bishop without a kilo there's no kilo all, without a though. panther, right? Right? You see At what I'm saying? All though, man. Right? There's just like you, you know, there's no martial arts. You you may be good at it, but you're coming out of this larger community, right? Yeah. And if we forget that it's rooted in maybe people escaping slavery. Yeah, for sure. If you're doing certain things, self-preservation, self-preservation, brutality, you know what I'm yeah. saying? Then then it's it, it all gets lost. And 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 there's a real push to really just, you know, like, let's just take this aspect of it. Let's just figure out how to do the chokehold. Yeah. You, know, hey. you do, you do the chokehold and don't understand about the peace element. <laughs> like I'm trying to love man. you and give you opportunity man. before I choke you out. Then you miss the whole point. Then you're running around like a cop choking people hey. and forgetting with like no, before, with no, no, with no love and respect for life and sanctity, which meant that you would have de-escalated. Like, I don't yep. want to have to choke you out, brother. So, yeah. let me <laughs> so let's let me show you, let me show you some love, but no, I'm just gonna choke you out. So you do you choke out enough people, then they're gonna come around, they're gonna choke you out one day. Yeah, too. yeah. You know what I'm saying? Then no, they don't respect real. you. It's so, real, man. No, so, I appreciate this perspective, man, because you know, hip hop, you know, I, I still, man, like you know. I'm going to try not to get too emotional here on a real level, but man, like when I think about everything that has come to my life, because I chose to write about hip hop yeah. because, because my, my guidance counselor said, you're failing everything, but English. And so I think you should write. And I said, well, I don't want to write about nothing that we know sports, see which one, which one about hip hop. Right. I mean, everything that came from that, this moment came from that moment. Yeah. You know what I mean? If Mr. King wouldn't have gave me the shot and Easy E wouldn't let me interview, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't have thought it was even possible. And and then I saw you, and then I was like, okay, now I know it's possible. You know what I mean? And it's just, you know, it's been a and, hell of a and journey, it, man. And it comes full circle because you know, back in the days we were coming up, martial arts was a part of it. Yeah. Even though people didn't consciously say, "Oh, martial arts," but exactly everybody practiced it. Yeah. And you know, you look at seminal figures like Bruce Lee, right? You know, in the East Coast, they looked at Bruce and they say, we admire him because he's about power mm -hmm. and we're going to take his swipes and incorporate mm -hmm. it in the dance. In the West Coast, they look at Bruce Lee and go, man, we like him. He represents power. We're going to take this and include it in our dance routines. We weren't doing <laughs> dance routines, but we're going to use this moment when he picks yeah, people up and then he's knocking true. everybody down. But then you're right there in the UK, go outside of London and talk to the people from the Northern Soul movement, right? Yeah. Because this is the same exact time as hip hop. So, and it's not in London, it's outside of London. So you talk to them and they had a group of people that were part of the Northern Soul scene, which was taking rare records that Barry Gordy kind of threw away and said, mm -hmm. this is not crossover enough. Mm -hmm. This is too black. They picked up those records and that became the basis for their DJ thing. Wow. 
but their B boys, we had B boys, they had soul boys. You know what their Bruce Lee move was? And I've interviewed huh. them. What their was move it? was like we looked at Bruce Lee and his move when he falls down and jumps back up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's their signature move. Going wow. on your back and, and then popping, popping up. back up. Three different places around the world. One 3,000 miles away if you're in New York to the West yeah. Coast. One 10,000 miles away or 12-hour flight away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 5,000, yeah. Looking at one guy named Bruce Lee and picking, seeing him from different angles. I see that. I see the so sword. So amazing. Yeah. I see this for the routine. I see his I see back. this from the pop-up. You know what I'm right? saying? And, 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 and within that, it is, it's applied to this uh, vibrant culture that one has nothing to do with the other, right? Totally. But they all exist at the same time. Same thing with James Brown. He has that same effect. Same totally. thing with Bob Marley, right? In, in New York, it was good foot and, yep. you know, and all that. In the West Coast, it was super bad. Yep. Out here, it was a whole other skis, right? And sometimes they overlap. It's not yep. that rigid. But the thing is that it's all based on the community that wow. we all come from. So hip hop is rigidly defined and it's a skill set. It's a skill set um, expression, but it's also open source hey, at the same time. If anything, it is open source. You're absolutely right. Now that's it's some tech stuff and. for you, boy. You know what but I mean? It's, like, but it's both and. Yeah, it's, it's you're and. right. You're right. You know, you know so, so it allows you to be a purist. But at the same time, it also be like, you know, I'm going to put this uh, I'm gonna put this belly dance aspect into it. <laughs> right. And we're going to add that to it. You know, my, my contributions to the culture, the belly dance aspect. I like that. I like that. That's your yep. next book. Next book. Yeah, next. Belly dance into the break of dawn. Dance. You know. <laughs> Yo, man, I'm, I'm going to end this the way I started it, man. You know, I want to thank you for your contributions to hip hop. I want to thank you for the care and, and, the, and, the, and the time that you took to document, write down, photograph, and interview people that a lot of people in the beginning maybe thought weren't that big of a deal or weren't didn't know how relevant they were, but you saw it and understood the value of it, man. So, you know, um, man, God bless you. Keep doing what you're doing. Looking forward to Can't Stop, Won't Stop, the next one. And, you know, whatever you're doing after that, I, I look forward to being there for that as well. No doubt. Bishop from Freedom Troop 982. <laughs> <laughs> West Coast, y'all. West Side. <laughs> Yo, man, Bishop Chronicles, Davy D, and that's how we do it. You know what I'm saying? Teacher, what star is that? It's my own secret technique. Bishop Chronicles. Bishop Chronicles. What's it called? Take me something out of me.